10, 10 countdown. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. This is the uh, workshop uh, discussion on um, legal tools for environmental justice. And uh, as I mentioned, we'd really like to have a discussion with everyone. So this is not meant to be a sort of panel. We happen to be up here up front, but um, we'd really love to uh, have a discussion with everybody and, and hear everyone's thoughts as well uh, and, and share your experience. So um, in that vein, uh, we'd like to, um, there's maybe a little bit too many people for sort of like person by person introduction, but we'd love to um, sort of get to know who's in the room a little bit. Uh, and before I do that, uh, I would like to caveat that when we're talking about legal tools, just so we, you know, set a little bit of shared foundation, um, a lot of folks, when they think of legal tools, they might think of litigation. Um, and that's sort of like the primary uh, legal tool that folks may be thinking about. But um, as we're going to discuss and we welcome everyone's thoughts on, legal tools can go far, far beyond litigation. It can be what residents are able to do. It can be what um, can be done as a collective. It can be do, uh, what individual residents do. Um, and it's a wide, wide variety of things that includes litigation, but that's by far not the only or even primary legal tool uh, for environmental justice. So um, I'd like to go with a show of hands. Uh, is anyone here a member of an environmental justice organization? Or considers yourself part of an environmental justice organization? OK, a few folks. Uh, is anyone here a lawyer? I'll say, Celine, you better reach out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and anybody here a community organizer or consider yourself a community organizer? Okay. And uh, last, certainly not least, uh, has anyone here ever been actually involved in an active lawsuit related to environmental justice? Okay. Yeah, that one got a lot of hands. Um, yeah, so we um, are really looking forward to this discussion. And maybe before we get started, just sort of a round of introduction so anyone who doesn't know who all of us are uh, and why we're sitting up here, um, we can talk about that briefly. Um, might I pass the mic to you, Vernice, to get us started? My name is Vernice Miller Travis, and I am the executive vice president for environment and social, environmental justice and social justice at Metropolitan Group, which is a social change agency, uh, B Corp. Um, we're headquartered in Portland, Oregon, but I work here in the DC office. Um, and I'm also the co-founder of We Act for Environmental Justice. And, and next month we'll be celebrating our 35th anniversary and um, started out by um, doing some big litigation against the city and state of New York. My name. My name is Renata Harris and I represent the Brown Grove Preservation Group. And we are a group of community members in Hanover County that are trying to protect our historic community, our national historic community from um, industrial gentrification and from the from industries taking over our community and our community is 153 years old and we have lawsuits we are galvanizing and we are getting media out there and so um, we started in 2020 and we are still pushing we're still learning and we have accomplished a lot so we are here to here today to share some of our strategies um, yeah Hi, everyone. My name is Steve Fishback. I'm the litigation director for the Virginia Poverty Law Center, which is the state support center for all the legal aid programs in Virginia. Um, I don't work exclusively on environmental justice, um, but it's part of my portfolio and I've worked with everyone on this panel um, to towards environmental justice in some way, shape or form and look forward to today's discussion. 
And I suppose I should introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jay Monteverde. I'm with NAMATI, a grassroots justice organization. Uh, I lead the US environmental justice program at NAMATI, and we focus on intersectional environmental justice across the mid Atlantic region in the US. Um, NAMATI also works in several other, other countries and convenes a global network of grassroots justice practitioners. And our focus is on uh, working at the intersection of law and community organizing. Um, and as you might have been able to guess from who's up here, uh, we are interested in um, talking a little bit about Brown Grove and Brown Grove Preservation Group's experience. And again, uh, folks in the uh, in, in with us here um, in the room would love to hear your experiences as well around using uh, legal tools defined broadly for environmental justice advocacy. Um, maybe for starters, Renata, um, just sort of a little bit introductorily, what's your experience been like using legal tools, would you say? So I would say, well, we started in 2020, and so a little bit of background about um, my community um, for, um, well, originally our community started in 1870 during the Reconstruction era, and our community is historic because it um, depicts a community that that is still intact till this day where the descendants still live in the community. And so land has been passed on for generations. And so that is why um, we have been recognized and a lot of people have been, um, other black communities have been coming to us and asking us, well, how can we make our community historic as well? And so the reason why we officially had to become historic is to, um, we weren't recognized as a black community. So, so that, that was, was one reason why we had to, we knew it in our heads, but our county did not recognize us as a black community. So we had to then strategize and say, no, we are, we are official, but on the EJ screen, it did not show us as a black community. So there was, um, for that reason, they didn't have, NEPA didn't come into play for, for us at that time until we proved that we were an African American community. And um, so that was one of the legal how how far do you want me to go into, into the legal strategies that we uh, we do have two we do have two lawsuits that um, we have right now. One of one of those lawsuits is about the zoning in our community. Um, there was um, um, some land in our community back in 1995 that was going to be um, a, a business, and um, we uh, we had a, back then we had a civic association, and they put together some proffers to protect that particular land. Um, bring us up to now in 2020, now those pro the, the county erased those proffers to protect the community. And that is what our lawsuit is about because they erased those proffers without notifying, without notifying us. And um, so we had, and then also we, so it's about, we're suing our county. Um, the, we have some community members that are suing, and along with the Hanover County NAACP, we are suing um, the Board of Supervisors and we're suing the um, DEQ because of um, they did not have meaningful participation and outreach during that process. And the other lawsuit that we have is on um, um, the other lawsuit that you're walking. It's the zoning suit and the, the water permits. They're, oh, the, the and the water permit. Yeah. Um, oh, I did just kind of put them put them together. Yeah. I did just put them. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, we did. So, actually, with our zoning lawsuit, um, our our Hanover County judge said, "Well, you guys do not have a case." So he dismissed the lawsuit. And um, there's an organization. Um, called Protect Hanover, and those residents, they took it to the state Supreme Court, and our Virginia State Supreme Court says, yes, you do have a lawsuit. So now it's back to our local um, judge who dismissed it in the first place, and so that's where it is now. Whether or not he's going to change his mind um, or whether he's... Uh, his ego is going to get the best of him because the Virginia State Supreme Court says, no, you were wrong in the first place. That's where we are now. Um, so uh, there was another 
um, session that I went to and we were talking about who holds the power and um, in my opinion, the people, the corporations and the ones that have money and the politicians hold the power. So we can look at all of these legal processes, but at the end of the, at the, end of the day, if the judge decides that, no, you still don't have standing, what does the, these legal processes do? What do they do? Can I, can I just ask a question? Why was it hard for them to determine that you all were a black community? What, what was that about? So when, when you look at the, um, when they were looking at the EJ screen and based on, um, they were looking at everything that was in a mile radius. And so Brown Grove is um, 1,200 um, acres. And so we have, within Brown Grove, you have a whole bunch of white subdivision, subdivisions. And so all of the, but those white subdivisions, they didn't get there until like the late nineties. And so all of those subdivisions, they kind of canceled us out as far as the EJ screen. Yeah. So if you look at, um, so all of this, um, all of these subdivisions here, they kind of took up our population. And so when you looked at the EJ screen, um, it, it, it made, for us, it made us like 18% black. And so that's why they said we were not, um, NEPA did not apply for us. And so the, um, I don't want to stand up. Who made that determination? Virginia DEQ? Yes. Can I just add one, one quick thing about that problem? Because it's a, you know, it's a real problem for smaller black rural communities. And this was also an issue in the Mountain Valley pipeline case, um, also in Virginia, not terribly far from Hanover, um, because the data is either going to be compiled on a census tract basis and sometimes on a census block basis, but in rural areas, both census tracts and census blocks are very large and do not necessarily comport to the geog to the boundaries of what a community like Brown Grove. And so when we wrote the Virginia Environmental Justice Act, we, we were very careful in making it clear that you that any discrete geographic area where the um, population of a particular protected class was um, larger than the statewide average. Um, it's, 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 it was important to, to be able to say any discrete geographic area because that way we weren't bound by census tracts and census blocks because smaller black rural communities may not be picked up because of that. Steve, could I ask you to say a, the, uh, a little bit more for folks who might not be familiar, why was that sort of the clarifying the concentration and showing the concentration of a black community, why was that important from a NEPA perspective? So, to be able to show that there was some sort of either disproportionate impact on uh, a community of color or that there is intentional racial discrimination going on. You have to show that there was a, 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 a an impacted protected community. That's why it was important. And I'm sorry, because I, no. <laughs> I no. didn't mean so, to catch Steve, you off. So Steve, is, is this an inherent flaw in the construction of EJ screen and the other mapping tool processes that we've come to <laughs> at the state levels? Well. I, well, I wouldn't call it an inherent flaw, because, but it's important to recognize the limitations of EJ screen. Um, it's a screening tool. It's not. A de it does not determine whether or not there is, in fact, a community of color there. Right. It just uses larger demographic data right. um, to make that point. And in and in, in rural communities, it's it, it it could miss a lot of them. And that's why we yeah. changed. That's why when we developed our legislation, we wanted to be clear that we weren't weren't bound by those, you know, very artificial boundaries. So I, I, I asked that question because when I think about the Mid-Atlantic region, when I think about EPA Region 3 and all the other federal demarcations for Region 3, most of our states are mostly rural, right, with pockets and concentrations of urban and suburban populations, but really mostly rural. Right. Virginia is a mostly rural state. Maryland is a mostly rural state. Delaware is absolutely a most it's small, but it's mostly a rural state. Um, West Virginia. Really? You know, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Right. 
So if this is a pattern and a practice, then that would that would determine or that would suggest why it has been so hard for the state agencies to even find these communities because they're using a mapping tool and a process that doesn't give you the ability to look distinctly at rural communities versus urban communities or suburban communities. Everybody is treated the same, right? And so if you go in one mile out, um, and but you miss a community like theirs, but you you would pick up everything that's in that one mile, and and but a subdivision that's that whose residents are mostly white versus a community that's mostly black will have by definition different kinds of land uses and different kinds of zoning and different kinds of proximate land uses right so just lumping everybody together in one geographic demarcation is not going to get you the kind of specificity that we've been saying to EPA and other agencies that you need a you need a better tool you need a better way to find these places and one thing that Brown Grove did, and it was also, repl they replicated something that was done in the Atlantic uh, pipeline case, was that community residents went door to door to document the demographic makeup of the community and also the, the geographic delineation of the community to show that these were, in fact, communities of color that were being disproportionately harmed by an environmental injustice. Renata, could I ask you if it if it makes sense, would you like to walk us through a little bit like the map and any other? So um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with Harlem Bartholomew. And he, well, who he is, um, we have um, a student researcher at, the, at Columbia University. Um, and his name is Corey Shaw, and he did some research on Harlem Bartholomew, and he created a lot of the comprehensive plans in the United States. And I'm, I don't, I'm not for sure. Okay. And so he created, um, including for Hanover County, and so he, we did um, find some documentation where he did. Um, plot out our community as um, blighted, a blighted community. And that was in the um, 1970s. And so um, what you're seeing here, uh, we were intersected by Interstate 95, as, uh, as with a lot of um, historic black communities um, right down the street from us is Jackson Ward. If you've traveled on 95 South, you have definitely went through Brown Grove. You've also went through Jackson Ward. Um, this all of these um, green, this is where you have, have a lot of homes. And the Brown Grove District is all in this yellow. So we had to create this map ourselves as um, tools to prove our case. And so you can see you have, this is one part of Brown Grove, and then you have the interstate running through it, and then you have the whole other section of our historic district. And with and all of this, everything that's in red, this was not here um, previously before 1960s. Then you have a regional airport that is right near homes. Um, a lot of people in the community, they had to, it was about 10 uh, individual families that had to move because the airport was expanding. And um, then you have our, our church and you know the church is the pillar of the black community. And one of the things that made us um, recognize as a intact black community. And then you have a um, concrete facility that you have dust, a concrete facility and a crane facility, and you have dust in the air, silica dust that people are breathing in in the air. Then we have a construction debris landfill here, here, here and that construction debris landfill, when um, old buildings are torn down, um, they're bringing that stuff in on these dump trucks and all of that dust, when you come down that road, you're gonna see that dust. And my dad constantly is calling the owner saying, you guys need to spray that road down. Um, and the homes around here, they're kind of dusty. You can see the dust on their homes. Um, and then you have the TA truck stop. And um, you, it's a major truck stop that's bringing in diesel fumes. And this here, this is our latest um, intrusion, and that is the Wegmans Distribution Center, not a grocery store, 
but a distribution center. And so this distribution center is taking up 20% of our community. And so with that distribution center, we're concerned about the traffic because it's on a two lane curvy road and we don't have any type of um, ditches that control the, the flooding on the on those roads and in people's yards. Um, and then we're concerned about our wetlands. It, it, it uh, they, Wegmans destroyed um, over 15 acres of wetlands in our community. And um, this color here, that's the color that our creeks are right now. And a lot of our residents have well water. And so I took a picture. I just happened to take a picture of our creek. I didn't show the, um, the before picture, but I, our stream was flowing. It was clear. Now it's just still and this murky color. And we were told that the um, creek would, after construction settlement, would, would go, um, that everything would change. Um, and you can see how this tractor trailer, this picture was just taken a couple of weeks ago. The tractor trailers, they take over the road. Mind you, we're going to have school buses with our kids sharing the roads with these tractor trailers. Um, one thing that we tried to do was we tried to um, get no through truck zoning on our some of our roads to mitigate the trucks from coming in and uh that was passed however there's nobody to enforce it so the trucks are still coming when 95 is backed up they're coming they're cutting through our roads so we're, st we're like okay well we passed the law but there's not, there's nobody to enforce it so um yeah thank you renata um so you were, thank you for the very quick introduction as well to, to Brown Grove. Did I see a hand? Did someone want to ask a question? A, so two things. I guess it sounds like urban renewal to storage your town, I guess, with some of these land uses. But I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm like in a state of shock now. So I don't even know what I was actually going to say. But I think that... Um, But um, <laughs> like I, I don't. I mean, like literally, I don't. I don't even know what I was gonna say. But I um, I'm like, I'm like, that's a shock too. I always got something to say. Well, one thing, <laughs> just think about the continuity of at least. Let's just focus on our region, right? Region three. Um, although this is a conversation that that is relevant for everyone and everyone who's listening online or everyone who showed up. It, it's not only about region three, but I'm just gonna zero down to this. Every single community of color in the mid-Atlantic region was altered fundamentally by I-95. Every single one. And it was intentional. It wasn't accidental, right? So you think about the, the legacy and the impact of transportation planning, and you think about the environmental impacts of that that are still happening to this day. So I know exactly where she's talking about. Now I know where she's talking about because she's right. Every time we drive south to North Carolina and, and Southern Virginia, we drive right through their communities every single time, right? And nobody even thinks about those communities over there, right? Because the highway is a bit elevated and the communities are sort of down. Um, so they get all the off-road um, emissions. They get stationary emissions. They get mobile emissions. They get fugitive dust, right? They give all. They get all of that. And every single community of color along the I-95 corridor has suffered that. So the, the dislocation of the communities, the eradication of some of the communities, there's a big part of Richmond that was completely eradicated by I-95. The same is true in Delaware. The same is true in Maryland. The same is true in Baltimore. The same is true in every state that I-95 goes through. In, in Phil oh my God, Philadelphia, you know, the Bronx, you know, I mean, everywhere that, that we, we, we're going to reach it too now, but my point is simply that um, the legacy of those decisions that were made decades ago, people are still living with that and people are still dying from that. And so when you think about growth and development, when you think about planning, when you think about land use, if you've ever heard me talk about these issues before, you've heard me talk about the work that we did in West, in, in West Harlem, when I started doing research and trying to figure out how did we get into this degraded situation, I, I can tell you the same exact story about West Harlem and the Harlem community, the same exact story. And when I started looking and peeling off labor, uh, layers and doing historical research on how we got here, zoning took us here. Zoning took us here and race-based land use and zoning. And if anybody tells you that zoning and land use are a neutral 
mm. regulatory process spit in their face or either tell them you are an idiot, right? If you believe that. So it's important. So what, what, what did we do when we found that out? I joined the zoning board. Well, let's just say I was voluntold to get on the zoning board. We had a good relationship with our county executive who at the time was, well, she was our uh, city council person, Ruth Messenger. And then she became the county executive for, for New York County for Manhattan. And we, we knew her really well. And we went out to dinner with her one night. And every time I was in Ruth's presence, I would rail about the zoning board, rail about the community board, community planning board. And she said to me one night, she said, so Vernice, how do you get on the planning board? And I thought about that for a minute. And I said, well, the mayor appoints 50% of the members and the county executive appoints 50% of the members. She says, am I the county executive? I said, actually you are. She said, so I could appoint you. And I knew where she was going when she said that. Right. And I was like, damn caught, um, you know, and she said, so you're going to be on that same zoning board that you rail about all the time. You're going to get on that zoning board. And now you're going to have to figure out what it's like to use that power. Or do you really have any power? Does being on the zoning board give you power versus the city agency, who is the city department of planning, right? And it actually did have a fair amount of planning, except nobody understood environmental law and land use. So here are all these people on the zoning board and they don't really understand what the power of is of the institution that they're sitting on. So they don't know how to use it. So I decided to go to graduate school and become an urban planner. I said, because every community of color in the United States is being destroyed by zoning and land use planning. And hardly any of us understand the process. So that's what I decided to do is to not only understand it for our own community, but to understand it and help teach people for every community that was involved in a fight like this, because the fight is about land use and zoning. So you got to go to the meetings. You got to go to the meetings. You have to go. Are they boring? Hell yes, right? They're mind numbingly boring. Oh my God, the things they talk about, the things that come up on the, on, on the agenda. Sit there for as long as it takes. If you can't sit there any longer, tag somebody else in, right? Bring everybody, bring everybody. So they only meet once a month, right? And they have committees. Show up because this is where they're carving up our communities and this is where these decisions are being made. And once they get made, it is so hard to turn them back. And that's why they're in the position that they're in. They're fighting over whether or not they have standing. Of course they have standing, they live there, right? But, but Steve? Pick it up. Pick it up? Pick up the conversation. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so did you want me to talk about the stand, like the bogus standing decision? Yes. Okay, so the Hanover Circuit Court judge ruled that these various residents didn't have standing because they didn't articulate a particularized harm that was suffered by them that was not suffered by the general public. And this judge had the most bizarre reasoning saying that like someone on the far side of the county w suffered the same injury and has, and hence it wasn't a particular particularized harm, even though someone on the far side of the county would not hear the same level of noise as someone living right next door, wouldn't be able to see, you'd have to experience the level of traffic you know, in, in, in the local area. I mean, it was just the most ridiculous decision. And I mean, our, our, our state Supreme Court, which is not really known as a, a great defender of racial justice and, and, you know, other good things, you know, reversed this judge because his ruling was just, you know, just, it was stupid to be <laughs> quite blunt. So, um, that that was the tech that was the reasoning that we were able to overcome and to show that these you know a, a homeowner that lived across the street from this facility obviously was going to suffer particularized injury that somebody on the far side of the county would never so that was that was the the victory that the brown grove folks had at the supreme court i'd like to piggyback real quick on what vernice was saying and then yes um we'd love to take some uh welcome some comments from folks or questions. Um, go to zoning meetings, join the zoning boards, join the boring processes and learn them bef when you go. Because a lot of times local governments, county governments, city governments, I've been in meetings or listened to, you know, live meetings online where the commissioners or, you know, council members were asking, do we have a city tax? 
do we have this? Do we have that? How does this work? Like they are not sure on the procedure procedures and the rules themselves. And they also need partners among residents and among communities to help actually do what the law, when the law is good, do what the law says. And so something that I've seen is really important is go and attend and know what the rules are supposed to be or know where you have um, the rules on your side. And it might seem arcane, but learn Robert's rules of order because they kill people with those Robert's rules of order, right? You can't speak, you're out of order. Um, we're in executive session, et cetera, et cetera. So I know Robert's rules of order in my sleep. I had to learn it because they kept denying people the right to speak and the right to show up and the right to register because they didn't understand Robert's rules of order. So what did we do? We did a training. We Act for Environmental Justice did a series of trainings on Robert's rules of order, how to understand it, how to deploy it, how to master it, and how to beat somebody over the head with it if you have to, but how not to get your voice shut out by not understanding the basic rules of the road, right? Which is Robert's rules of order. Um, oh. Uh, Kim Gaddy with Clean Water Action and Southwater Environmental Alliance. And so in New Jersey, we passed the cumulative impacts law, right? And so we um, now we are working with uh, Maurice in Pennsylvania um, to kind of pass that law here. And within our law, we created a new definition for overburdened communities. Um, and we actually had the state you know, change the maps. And so in the definition, and I don't know if this might help you, three things that we lifted up, at least 35% low income households, at least 40% of the residents identify as minority or as members of the state recognized tribal community, or at least 40% of the households have limited English proficiency. And so for us in some of those uh, rural areas in New Jersey, that was key. So I don't know if that is something that can then kind of help you all um, to make sure that you're not left out um, and then they, you know, have to address your concerns. So current, currently we are trying to do a cumulative impact assessment um, with the EPA. Um, however, they've been uh, pushing us onto a grant. Um, and we don't have, at the current time, we don't have the capacity to implement a grant to do the research that it takes to, like we have regular jobs, we have careers. And so you're asking us to do a full-time job um, with, with the grant that we, like we need to go to school, we need to go to college first to know how to do this cumulative impact assess, uh, assessment. And so we're, we're pushing back to the EPA and saying, no, like, you need to do your jobs. Um, this, but what they're saying to us currently is there is no framework for a cumulative impact assessment. Here to the 12 years, legislative senators, but I fought for 12 years for us to get it. I hope it does not. And that is one of the, one of the hopes from this workshop and this discussion, discussions like it, is to learn from the experience of folks who've already been down this path so that they don't have to spend 12 years or it took us, I think, 15 years to, you know, to get folks to recognize the, the problems and the challenges in facing the West Harlem community. Our hope and our desire is that nobody coming behind us will have to struggle and suffer as long as we all did to learn these lessons, but that you can take valuable lessons from, from what we've been able to learn, achieve, and do, and apply them in your circumstances. The challenge, the fundamental challenge that, that Renata and her community have is Virginia DEQ and the governor of Virginia, who doesn't give a damn about anybody or anything that's brown or black or poor or working class, environmental issues, anything that's not about his trying to decide whether he's gonna run for president, please do it, please, I need him to do it so we can put him out of his misery. But they were on a trajectory. Virginia DEQ was on a trajectory to do some really good work. But one of the things, we were doing some work with them, our organization was doing some work with them. And when we first started working with them, they literally said, and we were meeting with the entire leadership of the agency, that they were told it was their job to facilitate permitting on behalf of applicants, all applicants, that that was their job. That was their mission, their job as an agency. And I'm like, who told you that? 
I'm not a part of the Virginia legislature, but who the hell told you that? What makes you think that your singular job is to facilitate any applicant for any business, any industry, any land use to be able to actually get a permit? What about the people in the state of Virginia? And they looked back at me like I was speaking another language and we were not all speaking English. And so we took them through a process of helping them to understand what the job of the state environmental agency really is. And they, they started an EJ office. They moved some staff around. They were getting ready to do some big things, I think. And then they elected this man and everything went to hell. Right. So the, the levels that you have to organize on are multiple, right? There's local government. And, and don't sleep on local government. And no matter how bad they are, don't sleep on local government. You know why? Because they have a right to determine local land use and zoning that is invaluable, right? There have been several cases that have gone to the United States Supreme Court, which has definitively ruled local government has the sole authority to determine local land use and zoning unless the facility has a federal purpose, you know, like a sewage treatment plant in West Harlem. But other than that, you can't challenge that authority to make those decisions. So you have to train people in local government. How do you use the power and authority that you have as local government? We were in uh, we were in a in the other conference, the the Anacostia Community Museum Women's Environmental Leadership Summit, which is also going on at the same time. Ask me about that later. It's my fault um, that they're happening at the same time. And the folks were there from Warren County, North Carolina, from the sort of the mother struggle that launched the environmental movement. And one of the preeminent organizers from that, Miss Dolly Burwell, um, after they fought and lost their battle to prevent a PCB landfill from being cited in their rural community, Dolly ran for the Register of Deeds. And she served in that, she got elected and she served in that position for eight years. And so I asked her in a panel discussion today, I asked her a question, what made you run for register of deeds? And she said, because I wanted to make sure that there was never, ever again, a land use or an application or a sale of land in Warren County, North Carolina, that we did not know about, that I did not know about. And she said, I would scrupulously review those land use applications and those um, those deeds for selling land, transferring land, citing whatever, whatever. Dolly is not a lawyer, although she did used to be three Congress people's chief of staff, but Dolly is not a lawyer. Um, but she said, I had to learn whatever the process was. I ran and I ran again and again and again and served in that job for eight years. Now, that's that's why I joined the, land, the, the planning commission. Somebody in the community has got to be in these tables where these decisions are happening. And again, I'm not saying it's going to be fun, right? I'm not saying it's going to be all joy, but if you want to defend the interests of your community, you got to get to these tables where it's happening and then pay attention to who your elected representatives are. We were represented by all black and brown people in the New York state legislature and not a one of them gave a damn about what was happening to us. So we had to replace them and replace them we did, all of them, all of them. One of them now is the first Dominican ever elected to the United States Congress. He started out as a Democratic district leader representing Washington Heights. We ran candidates, we did all of that kind of work. So is it easy? It's not easy. You gotta organize politically, you gotta organize socially, you gotta organize environmentally, you gotta mobilize young people, you gotta get people out to vote, all of that. It's what it takes to defend the interests of our communities because the system is stacked so that other people are making decisions that affect our lives that are killing us. And the only way you change that is if you have different people showing up in those seats. I, we, I will say this, last thing I'm gonna say on this subject. Um, the organization that Kim works for, Clean Water Action, and I'm on the board of, we had a colleague, in fact, he used to be the mayor of this town, um, Andy Fellows was the mayor of College Park, Maryland, but he was also the Chesapeake Regional Director for Clean Water Action. And for years, Andy would take the canvassing crew, we do door-to-door -door mobilization, we knock on doors and talk to people and engage people at the community level about clean water issues. And Andy kept going to Northern Virginia. And I kept telling him, this is a complete freaking waste of time. Why are you going to the place that still has a highway named Jefferson Davis Highway? I mean, really, what you gonna do down there, right? 
and Andy kept going and he kept taking canvases and they kept going. And I'll be damned if in 2008, Virginia does not turn blue and, and vote for Barack Obama. Not because of what was happening in Southern Virginia, but because of what was happening in Northern Virginia. Now, Clean Water Action was not the only organization mobilizing, but people recognized that things were changing in Northern Virginia and different kinds of people were moving there. And as long as we got those people out to vote, we could do something different in Virginia. I don't know what we lost, what we forgot, what didn't happen that got the current governor in there, but you got to organize every kind of way. And Andy showed me something. Don't turn away any opportunity to make change, right? And I told him, I said, you are wasting your money and you, you make me want to stop giving money to Clean Water Action. All this energy you spending on Northern Virginia. He was right. He was right. And we have to do that in every community and every place that we are. Yeah, I have, I have a question. Um, I'm Shannon Baker Branstetter. I work for Center for American Progress. Uh, so the Roberts Rule of Order made me <laughs> think of this. Um, I hate Roberts Rules of Order. I understand the advice to learn it. I also wish we could just get rid of it <laughs> because I do think it's a barrier for a lot of people. Um, but along that, that line of just like when to use the system that exists, you know, when to use litigation, when to use Robert rules, when to use you know, zoning board versus changing the law or changing the rules. It's going to be case by case. But how do you just think about like when to work within the system or when you just have to like go to the mat and just start over? Why is the mic traveling in my direction? Talking, so I want you to have a chance to talk. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> I mean, I don't think there's an easy answer to that question. I mean, you, you've got to use the tools to do the job. Um, and sometimes the tools are litigation and Robert's rules. And sometimes they're not um, because the law is not good. And then you got to work on changing the law. Um, so I, I, I just don't think there's a really easy answer to the question. I wish there was. I think I'm going to add. I think simultaneously you're going to have to do all of it. Um, you, you're going to need to know what law applies to your situation and and use that. Is, is, the, is the issue the water? Is the issue the air? Does people, does people in my community to drink from the well water? Is it... Um, um, a particular chemical that we're concerned about. Um, then we have also used like the media. Um, some some legal uh, attorneys they may be against using the the media. They may say let the lawsuit play out. But lawsuits take time, and by the time that our lawsuit is finished, the building will be up, the damage will be done. So we can't just depend on this lawsuit. I'm going to have to put pressure in the media as well because people don't like, businesses don't like, politicians don't like when they're looked at um, badly in the media. In, in the media. So for us, when we put shine the light on um, our county and said, this is what has been done over the years, um, that's when they came to the table and said, okay, we need to really engage with you. So now we've been having monthly meetings on how we want our comprehensive plan to look in the next 20 years, for, specifically for our community. We're saying, and we took it, we was like, okay, this plot of land is, is available. We don't, this is, and it's currently zoned this. Okay, this is what we want right here. And this plot of land, no, these are the things, like very detailed, very specific. No, we don't want those things. So now when a business owner puts in an application and my representative can say, no, that's not what my people want. And so also um, just having uh, allies because we didn't, we did not know any of these laws. You know, so you it's it's a kind of doing both things. You got to fight in the media, um, even with Wegmans. We had a a, um, a article in the Washington Post, and only then did they want to come and sit at the table with us because they knew that the governor was Governor Northam was pushing this project, and it was his baby. He was going to bring seven hundred jobs to Virginia, and. He, they knew that permits were going to go through, but it was only when we put national attention on them that they want to to come to the table. So, 
She's 100% right. You got to do everything. You got to do every strategy. You have to have an organizing strategy, right? To have a public education strategy, to have a legal advocacy strategy, a legislative advocacy strategy. Is the law at the local level, is it insufficient? What do we need to change? Who do we, what, what is our strategy to do that? Who are the county commissioners or the city council members? Who do we have to mobilize to get them to recognize that the law is insufficient or it is adversely affecting the same populations of people again and again and again? And then there's a state legislative strategy, right? And then I work on national policy, right? So while everybody is doing all of that, I'm working on what do we need to change nationally, right? So we're working on NEPA. Um, we're working on Clean Water Action is working on um, and uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'll be enraged. The Waters of the United States rule, right, which we just lost um, a big case in the Supreme Court about that. But there's still things you can do through local government to affect what happens at, at that bigger level. Um, and then you have to educate people. You have to train people. So we at West Harlem Environmental Action have an environmental education program and a community mobilization program, and a community public health program where we train people on what are the issues, what is the conversation, what is the lingo, what do you need to know, what do you want to have in the conversation. So we just, last, last year, the New York City Council changed the lead law in New York. We've been working on that for 18 years, 15 years, 15 freaking years, but we finally got it done, right? And that's what I say about don't get up from the table. And if you have to get up, tag somebody else in, and especially let's bring some young folk into this conversation. Because one, they're better at it, frankly. Um, they have better tools, right? And they have different ways of organizing and mobilizing people, but you have to do all of that. And it's a shame that you have to work on so many different levels to achieve the kind of change and transformation that's gonna be protective of community interests, but that's what you have to do. Um, and then litigation if necessary. And so when we filed our lawsuit in 1992 against New York State and New York City over the mismanagement um, of the North River Sewage Treatment Plant, of course, our issue is air pollution. And we're all assuming that this is going to be a Clean Air Act. So we partnered with the Natural Resources Defense Council that I eventually went to work for. But when we did this, I wasn't working at NRDC. And they teach a legal clinic at NYU Law School. The Environmental Legal Clinic at NYU Law School is taught by NRDC for 25 years, more than 25 years. And they put their students on researching what is the best environmental legal av avenue that the residents in West Harlem have to fight about air pollution for the sewage treatment plant. So we just knew we're getting ready for a Clean Air Act lawsuit. And they're researching, a year goes by, and like, we don't hear from them. We're like, well, we guess this is not happening. And then they come back and they report out to us and they're like, well, it's not going to be a Clean Air Act lawsuit. And we're like, but the air pollution is so awful here. And they're like, yeah, except sewage treatment plants have a carve out in the Clean Air Act. And I'm like, who are the idiots sitting around the table who decided that? Some of them were people who worked at NRDC, I just want to say. Um, and that's why I do national policy advocacy, because the people who signed off on that were people who knew they would never live proximate to a sewage treatment plant. So they could sign off on, you know, a carve out in the clean air because it was never going to affect them. But when I sit at the table and do national policy advocacy, I think from the perspective of somebody who lived in an environmentally overburdened community. I think from the perspective of somebody who lived in the community in the United States with the highest exposure to fine particle pollution, PM 2.5, of any community in the United States, the highest incidence of asthma and the highest rate of premature death from asthma. That's not the case anymore, but that was the case when we were doing this work. So when I am in the conversation, I'm thinking about a lot of things differently than people who will never... Um, have to go to the emergency room at the local municipal hospital to save the life of their child or their resident. My mother was a nurse at our local hospital for 43 years. She died from complications from pneumonia, right? She had a rare respiratory condition that no doubt was from living in a community with the highest rate of PM 2.5 exposure of any community in the United States. It's personal to me, but it's also personal about my neighbors. 
my, my used to be neighbors. It's also personal about all the people and all the funerals that I ever attended of people who died before their time. So when I sit at the table, my perspective about national environmental policy is very, very different than people who think about it from, you know, I studied this in graduate school. I studied this in law school. I really know this. I know it. I can cite chapter and verse on the Clean Air Act, right? And what's wrong with it. And I teach other people about that. So you want to teach people, what does the law say, right? Where are the provisions in the law? Where do communities have standing? There are lots of environmental laws where the public has standing, right? How do we fight in those spaces? So you teach people how to fight with every tool that they have, and then you build alliances with folks like NAMITI, right? Like NRDC, I mean, they did a phenomenal job representing us, a phenomenal job representing us. And what did we do? We filed a nuisance lawsuit. Now, of all the things that I thought we would be fighting over, it was not public nuisance. It was not. That was the only legal standing that we had in New York City to go after that sewage treatment plant. And we won, right? So nuisance is, um, man, boy, this is going back. Um, nuisance law is where you have a land use, Steve, help me, where you have um, uh, a practice or a policy that creates a consistent and a persistent public nuisance to the enjoyment, in our case, of private property. So it was people could not breathe in their own apartments. People could not go out on their balconies. People could not go outside in the park, right? People could not enjoy the basic quality of life things that communities south of us could because we had the sewage treatment plant that was, that was emitting raw methane, flaring methane at the same level, their stacks were at the same level as people's apartments. So the methane was going right into people's homes, right? So, and you would think that would be a violation of the Clean Air Act, but it's not, right? So public nuisance. And we won. We beat them half to death um, in that litigation. Bless you, NRDC. Um, they asked for the case to be dismissed time and time and time again. We won again and again and again on those dismissal claims. And then they, when we settled the lawsuit. We settled the lawsuit on the very last day that David Dinkins was the mayor in New York City. And the next day, Rudolph Giuliani was sworn in as the mayor of New York City. So we were doing triple time. In fact, it was New Year's Eve when we settled that lawsuit. They paid us $1.1 million and they spent 55 million capital dollars to fix the problems at the sewage treatment plant. How long did that take us? The litigation took us two years, but the organizing took us 15 years, right? To get nobody. I don't want to see them have to spend that kind of time. I want them to be able to learn from what we did so that they can be successful and they can prevail. Yeah. Uh, John Mateko from Delaware. Uh, I want to ask you about the intersection here of climate change and land use. Now, evidently, you can't say those words in Washington because I never hear it. Now, maybe at the staffer level, uh, they, they do it. You mean Washington, D.C.? Or Washington? Yeah, I mean Washington, D.C. Okay. Right. I never hear it. I hear about what corporations can sell us, and I got the, the panels on my roof, and I got the $50,000 EV2. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying everybody else. It goes both ways with the climate change. It's a rare situation, and this is the place, the highways. You got the impacted communities with legal standing, and you can do that. You got the best available science, two types of reports. This little one is the special report, 2018, special report just on how land use, what you're talking about, is not only bad for the people, guess what? It's equally bad for the whole climate. So this is the special report on how it creates the overall problem. Legally, this is beautiful. It's the same science, best available science. Then they have another report in 22 where they introduce all, for the first time really, all the social science. 
And the world expert on this is right up the road, beautiful lady Karen Seiko at Yale. She did it in 2014 on land use and how the effect that has on people in the neighborhoods. And she did it in 22, and she's already the chair of an advanced planning for, I think it's next year, they'll hold it. They're gonna bring all the landscape architects and people like you right there. The effect of, on the local communities and what is not happening and how the local communities, the mayors, the people can do it and nobody else can and how it's killing the babies and the just what you were talking about now this is look at how this is a package you have the best available science says it creates the global problem killing people the best same best available science rare that this happens same people they can't argue like this they say the mitigation and then they spell it out what the, I'm an architect, what the architects, the city, the uh, traffic engineers, the whole bit, how you do it, it works. All of that is in one place. I never hear it out of the, the guy who's the summer resident of Delaware, Joe Biden. Do you hear it? Are there opportunities to use the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, and these special reports on land use and the big one that's coming up next year. All of that type of stuff is already in the can. Karen Cito is right up at Yale. She's fabulous. She, she owns this. You look back at the mitigation report from 2014. She chaired it. She was the uh, global northern leader, super bright lady. She's running this woman of color and she's at Yale she did it in 2014 she did it in 22 uh, 2022 and she's doing it again coming up is that happening can you use that huge gift because all the science is put together it's the best available science they bring in all this wonderful stuff like recommendations how do you do it to stop the babies and the planet, by the way. You know, there's more than just local communities. And they say things like you get a social agenda. You may have to tax, increase the taxes at the marginal rate, like we had with the good Republican. Ike, the general of the armies, bring back 91% marginal rates. And built the highway system. But that's all, of, all of that is a package. It's rare, I've never in my life seen that, where you put the social agenda and the physical agenda together with the best available science. Is it, it can you help us out with the law? Yes. Thank you, John. And I'd like to pause for a second to say that I think next year I'm going to recommend to Jacoby that we spend more time on legal tools for environmental justice, although, though I'll uh, be careful what I ask for. Um, would you like to answer that briefly, I'll Bernice? Start and then and I'll we'll move down the table. Yeah. Um, so I'll say this to you about um, President Biden. He has turned out to be, the, from an environmental justice perspective, the most progressive president that has ever occupied the White House. And there's no comparison between Barack Obama and Joe Biden when it comes to standing up and standing for environmental justice. Absolutely no comparison. He has not only moved this agenda forward, but he has put billions of dollars, billions of dollars on the street so that we can think differently, we can act differently, but most importantly, we can get the federal government to stop backstopping all the bad things that keep happening to our communities. He is tasking every federal agency to articulate an environmental justice plan, to do it on an annual basis. The Office of Management and Budget has to review that plan. They're called equity action plans and EJ action plans. He's got a climate plan that's moving through every federal agency and making them think and act differently. Now, there's some outlier agencies the Department of Defense and the Army Corps engineers, they need to be in this conversation in a bigger way than, than they are, but I think they're, they're even being pulled in. But yes, we talk about this all the time. And in the environmental justice framework, 
This is our framework. We've been trying to teach everybody else that this is the way that you do planning. You do atmospheric sciences, you do pure sciences, you do social sciences, you do grassroots mobilization, but you have to do it all at the same time. The reason that we're here is because we keep doing everything separately and not looking at it in an integrated fashion. The definition of environmental justice, right? is where you live, where you work, where you play, where you recreate, where you, are, where you go to school, everything, everything. There's no facet of your life that does not come into the sphere of environmental justice. We've been trying to teach people that for 40 years. And we finally have a president that embraces our framework, right? So he is doing a damn good job from my perspective, from an environmental justice standpoint now. We, we still, still can throw down on the Mountain Valley Pipeline, and we still will throw down on the Mountain Valley Pipeline. And all the other things that they keep trying to pull out on the side. Watch Joe Biden, right? I mean, not Joe Biden. Watch Joe Manchin. Um, he, he is coming, and he is not letting up from what he is trying to do for the coal industry, the last gasp of the dying coal industry, right? But we are trying to get all these disciplines together. We are. We are trying to get the landscape architects to think about social justice and cultural preservation. That's something that they're working on, right? Culture and history are important aspects of this and making sure that no more communities get eradicated off the face of this country because we didn't do integrated planning. So yes, we are trying to do this all the time. I would love to know more about that report and the person that you mentioned. It would be great if we could get her to this conference. Last thing I'll say is Dr. Wilson, is the person who holds up all these disciplines here in, in this region. He is the person who challenges all of the state agencies. He is the person who challenges this very university to stop thinking and acting in silos, but to get the School of Public Health and the law school and all the other schools to be working together in an integrated fashion. And we need to start training young people, whether they be in college and university or wherever, to see the integrated way that people live and therefore the integrated way that you have to apply your expertise, right? You can't just be an architect. You gotta be an architect that has a social awareness. You can't just be a lawyer, right? That doesn't think about planning, doesn't think about science, doesn't think about impact, doesn't think about agricultural policy. You gotta know all of that. And that, that is the brilliance of people who work on environmental justice. We do all of this. We don't get paid for doing all of this, but we do all of this because we have to do all of this. Thank you, Bernice. And to piggyback on what you were just saying, uh, and to tie it into something Renata was saying earlier around finding the right kind of legal expert, um, I know Renata, you and Brown Grove had, a, had an interesting experience um, in trying to find uh, the right legal expert. Could you talk a little bit about what was important in that experience what you look for in a legal expert and what are some things folks might want to watch out for? Um, part of that was um, reaching out to organizations that had um, a law, lawyers on their team that could take the case. We did reach out to the um, SELC. Um, we also reached out to Earth Justice, but ultimately um, the NAACP um, they were able to fund our, our lawyer. Um, and then with that was for the Brown Grove community specifically. Um, and then the other lawsuit that the neighboring community has, um, well, and then there also, there's also two residents with that live in the Brown Grove community that are on that other lawsuit. They, they paid for the lawyer themselves, but, um, Finding the, the the right lawyer that can relate to the community and the community needs and um, because trying to story tell your story to a, a lawyer to even get them to take the case and to understand what a black a historic black community is and that was per, part of our challenge. Um, We've came over that hurdle now with our uh, with our current lawyer, but it was definitely a struggle for him to relate to us and for him to know um, that 
some of the, the residents have been dealing with a lot of oppression and they don't feel heard. So um, they may not want to tell their story in a, in a certain um, light. And so we had to reach out to other lawyers within, um, within the EJ community to be a liaison for us, for us to even understand what our, what our case meant. Um, so that's where Steve came in. We're like, okay, so we have this lawsuit. What does it mean? We don't know. We can't get in contact with our lawyer because we just don't have access to him. And so, um, yeah. So Steve, <laughs> that's so when, whenever think whenever something we was like, Steve, can you reach out to, to our lawyer? We're having difficulty communicating with him, and we definitely my our lawyer and us we definitely had a, a powwow. And he definitely said I was one of the most difficult clients. Well, I wasn't his client. I'm technically, I wasn't his client, but you know, I was one of the. Well, I wasn't a, a, on the lawsuit. Press, yeah, um, and so he, you know, and I was doing a lot of publicity, and he did not. Um, he wasn't too fond of the publicity that I was doing, and so. Um, He's like, you're you're going to hurt the case, but you know, I'm I'm like, I'm a community member, and I'm just sharing our story. So just trying to navigate and and having a lawyer that is sensitive to what the community wants and is not just stuck in his legal fr um, his legal frame. And then we just ha also had to build a trust for him because we're like, okay, he's a lawyer, but he's friends. He's friends with the the Wegman's lawyer. He's a friends with the opposing attorneys. Uh, the opposing, um, the defendant's lawyer, they're friends. So, you know, trying to navigate all of that, it was a real um, time for us that we, we definitely had to sit down and have a conversation like, you're our lawyer, but we do not trust you. And then we got over that. But sometimes you got to have those heart to heart, um, heart to heart talks um, with finding a lawyer. And then even, Even with that, that it, it was time, time sensitive. sensitive. We needed a lawyer fast, fast and quick because, because we had a certain time frame to file this lawsuit based on, you know, that certain that permit. So, um, yeah. Did you want to add anything to that? The only thing that I'll add is um, there's like a, a, a style of practice called community lawyering or movement lawyering um, that is really well tailored to do EJ work. Um, community lawyering is something that's still a work in progress. Um, it's being taught more in law schools now than it was back in my day when the term didn't even exist. Um, so trying to find an attorney who understands that the power dynamic between lawyers and clients needs to be equal footing and not you know, uh, not a, using a lawyer who sees his job as controlling yeah. his or her clients, um, because that's often what's taught in law school, that you need to be able to control your client. And that's just like so antithetical to doing EJ. I mean, it's really important that the lawyer, you know, listens to the community and does what the community wants, even if it's sometimes not what the lawyer thinks is best because being a good community lawyer is about empowering your clients and and giving them power um, as as best as you can. Did you want to call on people? Because that's we're okay. We, I'm getting lots of signals that we don't have. We're out of time. Uh, oh, um, but please, you know, we're not running away. Um, the and. Very sorry for this abrupt ending, but thank you very, very much for joining. Um, yeah, please continue to talk to all of us. Thank you for coming to the symposium. And yeah, stay in touch. Thank you. Everybody. Are we allowed to ask questions? Yes.